we will start formally with uh, our lecture on labor law and social legislation. And uh, first of all, you know what is labor. When you talk about labor, uh, strictly speaking, uh, this is uh, plain and simple uh, physical or mental uh, exertion or effort. But you have to consider that uh, labor law, uh, labor, shall I say, is uh, intertwined with the uh, concept of manpower as defined under the Labor Code of the Philippines. In other words, within the context of the Labor Code of the Philippines, when you talk of labor, you talk about manpower. And what is manpower? Manpower is actually uh, that portion of the population of the state that is uh, necessary to produce goods and uh, services. So, uh, in uh, labor law, when you talk of labor, you talk about manpower. When you talk about manpower, you talk about labor. So, what is labor law? Of course, when you talk of labor law, this is actually uh, a law, rule, or regulation that uh, regulates uh, employer-employer relationship. The employer that uh, has control and supervision of another known as his employee, and the latter is paid compensation by the former. Of course, uh, there are several uh, uh, definitions given uh, by different uh, authors, also the, by the Supreme Court, on what is uh, labor law. But of course, the juridical foundation of the meaning of uh, labor law is, of course, the uh, the existence of uh, employer-employee relationship. Now, uh, we will try to uh, understand more on labor law when you, uh, we talk and discuss about the different types of labor, labor law. This was given the bar uh, several times already. Uh, I discussed this in my book under uh, taxonomy of labor law. Other authors have, uh, have uh, classified labor law into three. We have uh, labor standards law, uh, social legislation, uh, also uh, labor relations law. Incidentally, I have uh, discussed this uh, in my book, uh, uh, labor law, uh, social legislation, labor relations, labor standards. But, uh, uh, there were additional classifications. We have protective legislation, administrative legislation, and uh, diplomatic uh, legislation. Okay. First of all, we uh, discuss what is this protective legislation. When you talk of uh, protective legislation as one of the uh, types or classifications of labor law, uh, protective legislation simply means what? This is a law that is designed to protect certain workers who are unfairly treated in an employment contract. In other words, uh, the employment contract is unfair to these uh, types of workers. And who are these types of workers who are usually unfairly uh, treated in an employment contract? We have uh, uh, women workers, we have uh, children workers. So laws that protect uh, women, laws that protect children are classified under protective legislation. Okay. Now in the case of uh, laws that protect women, of course, uh, you know some of these laws, we have Republic Act 6725, which uh, prohibits uh, worse forms of abuses. And uh, what are the worst forms of abuses provided for under the law? Or, no, no, no. The discriminatory practices, shall I say. Now, uh, the uh, four types of discriminatory practices that are prohibited under Republic Act 6725 are the following. We have discrimination in pay, discrimination in work opportunities, discrimination in uh, hiring, and discrimination in dismissal. So, these are the four types of uh, discriminations 
that are prohibited, prohibited under the law, aside from those that are provided for under the labor code, like what? Uh, discrimination such as what? A stipulation against merits. That uh, a woman employee is required to sign the, a contract of adhesion in an employment contract that should she get married, she will be dismissed or deemed to have renounced her uh, employment with uh, the company. And uh, there are cases, uh, there are cases on this uh, matter. We have, uh, you know, these cases. You have come across these cases in your regular class. Uh, we have this CL uh, versus Paul. We have this PTNT versus NLRC. Well, uh, my favorite uh, case was actually this PAL uh, uh, CLCTA versus PAL, where uh, a stewardess of uh, PAL was taken in by PAL. She's a very beautiful lady with a Coca Cola body. So uh, she's an erudite woman. She uh, finished her uh, education. She was easily taken by uh, Paul, but uh, before employment, she was required to uh, sign an employment contract that should she get married, she will be dismissed. So after some time, or after employment, uh, because of biological reasons, she uh, got married. When uh, Paul learned about this, uh, what happened? She was uh, dismissed. Naturally, she uh, filed the case of uh, illegal dismissal with uh, the regional arbitration branch of the NLC having uh, territorial jurisdiction over the workplace of the complaint. And during the uh, preliminary conferences, uh, Paul argued that uh, the dismissal was valid and uh, uh, Ms. Yalcita voluntarily sign the employment contract that should she get married, she will be dismissed. And furthermore, uh, the Paul argued that uh, if uh, Miss Yalcita gets married, naturally, she will get pregnant. But finally, when the decision came out, the decision uh, runs this way. Getting married doesn't necessarily get pregnant, said the decision. One can get married without getting married, without getting pregnant, in the same manner that one can get pregnant without getting married. So this is a very beautiful decision. It is logical. It is based on natural law. Because uh, why uh, require a woman not to get married? This is an this. Uh, is an end of civilization. By the way, uh, there are other uh, discriminatory practices uh, against uh, a woman employee. Uh, dismissal of a woman employee uh, for the reason that she might get pregnant again. Oh, this is uh, actually uh, a discriminatory practice. Aside from this, uh, what are other practices that are discriminatory in nature? There are several, but in the meantime, we have this. We have the discussing case where all the the practice or the policy of the company is the discriminatory in nature. Still, the Supreme Court uh, validated the uh, this uh, di uh, this discriminatory policy. And this uh, discriminatory policy was actually uh, discussed by the Supreme Court in the case of uh, Duncan versus Glass uh, Welcome. This is known as the Duncan Doctrine, which was actually uh, penned by uh, no other than my chairman of the bar, 2008 bar exam examination, Chairman uh, Justice uh, Dante Ortina. I happen to uh, submit this uh, bar question on the, this uh, matter, but uh, Justice Tinga told me not to uh, give this because for sure 
he being the chairman of the bar. Uh, uh, the bar, exa bar examiners uh, already knew this case, so we have to, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, we have to uh, refrain from giving this uh, uh, bar question. So what is the, uh, the gist of this case? It is actually a discriminatory policy. Where? Why? Because uh, it, uh, this discriminatory policy is uh, a policy which prohibits uh, marriage of uh, an employee to another employee of a competing company. And the best example here is, of course, pharmaceutical uh, companies. So here, a, co a company requires its uh, employees not to marry an employee of another competing company. For what reason? To protect business interests. And uh, Justice Tinga has the uh, occasion to discuss the uh, historical background of this uh, part of this doctrine. And uh, actually, this is an American doctrine. Uh, which is uh, bona fide occupational qualification test. Under American jus jurisprudence, they uh, call this bona fide occupational qualification test. But the same concept uh, was uh, actually uh, provided under uh, Philippine jurisprudence under the concept of uh, the standard of reasonable test. So when you talk about the bona fide occupational qualification test or standard of reasonable test, the concept is the same. In other words, people, in order to protect business interests, the policy of the company prohibiting its employee to marry another employee when a competing company is valid in order to protect certain confidential information, marketing uh, strategies, and of course, uh, uh, such as uh, manufacturing formulas. On this basis, the Supreme Court validated this uh, allegedly discriminatory policy. So you know now uh, uh, people that uh, this is a uh, this is an exception to the rule that a discriminatory policy can be validated in order to, uh, to protect uh, business and interest. Under what doctrine? Uh, that is what? Uh, bona fide occupational qualification test, or otherwise known as the standard of reasonable uh, test. Well, there are other laws that protect women like what, uh, pro providing uh, proper seating facilities to women, providing nurseries to uh, those who have uh, uh, young babies, so that during their off period they can uh, uh, nurse their babies in the nursery. This is in accord with uh, the policy of the government to uh, promote uh, breastfeeding as uh, best for babies up to uh, two years. You know what I mean, up to two years only. Oh, by the way, uh, there are other laws that protect women, like this Republic of uh, uh, This law that prohibits worst forms of abuses. There are uh, four types of uh, abuses that are prohibited. We have uh, uh, physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse, and uh, economic abuse. So these are the worst forms of abuses that are prohibited under the law. And in this law, uh, incidentally, this law also defined the uh, the uh, concept of a battered woman syndrome. I suppose you still remember the case of people versus uh, Inosa, where uh, a woman employee is uh, exculpated criminally and civilly, although 
she killed her husband, provided that uh, she has been afflicted with this uh, battered woman syndrome. Oh, there are other laws that protect women. We will now go to uh, laws that protect children. There are several laws, BDC, Sotri, and others. But uh, what is important in, uh, in the protection, law on protection of real children, I will give you a sure guide, guideline, for you to remember uh, any question that may be given in uh, child labor. Remember that uh, a minor worker absolutely cannot be uh, employed in hazardous or deleterious undertaking. In other words, if you know what is hazardous or deleterious undertaking, then, surely, you can answer any bar question on this uh, area, provided you know this deleterious or hazardous undertaking. So what is deleterious or hazardous undertaking? Any undertaking that uh, affects the physical, mental, psychological, moral, and normal development of a child worker. In other words, can you employ uh, a child worker in an atomic factory? Of course not. Can you, can you employ a child worker in a paint factory? This was given the bar already, paint factory. Of course not. Deleterious, a sad, a sad loose undertaking. Can you employ a child worker as a machine operator or an, an operator of uh, a bulldozer? With his pumpers on? Of course not. This is still a child worker. You can have. Can you uh, employ a child worker in a gambling casino? Of course not. Can you uh, employ a child as an advertiser promoting uh, uh, alcoholic drinks and uh, other spirits? Of course not. Can you uh, employ a child uh, especially a child, uh, a child worker, a, a uh, girl who would promote, uh, shall we say, uh, so en. Huh? Mas malaki pa yung so en sa kanyang dibdib. Tapos nakapampers pa lang siya. Of course not. These are matters that are deleterious or asardus. Anything that affects the normal development of a child worker moral development, physical development, are matters that are prohibited. In other words, if the undertaking is not deleterious, not hazardous, then surely a child worker can be employed. So these are the examples under what we call uh, protective uh, legislation. Okay. We will now go to another area, and that is uh, labor standards. Incidentally, this was defined by the Supreme Court in Maternity Children's Hospital case, which simply means what? It is a law that provides the standards. labor standards? Because it is the law that provides the standards. What standards? Standards as to wages, hours of work, cost of living allowances, including health, safety, dental, medical, and compensation benefits. In other words, we, when you talk of uh, labor standards law, this is a law that provides economic benefits while the worker is actually working. And what are the laws that, uh, what are some of the laws that provide economic benefits, like uh, uh, a wage order providing a wage increase? like uh, an agreement in the CBA providing for uh, an increase uh, of wages under uh, escalator clause, you know, the escalator clause in the collective bargaining agreement. Actually, if the uh, employer violates the, an economic provision in the, in the escalator clause of the CBA, 
there the uh, the employer, the company is liable for an unfair labor uh, practice. In other words, what are these economic benefits? An increase in uh, holiday pay, an increase in uh, service incentive leave pay, an increase in uh, wages, an increase in premium pay, in deferential pay, in portal pay, and other economic benefits. In other words, these are economic benefits granted to a worker while the worker is actually working. Does it mean to say that there are economic benefits that are granted to the workers or a worker while he is not working? Of course, yes. And this is covered by social or what we call uh, welfare legislation. So what is welfare or uh, social legislation? This is a law that provides economic benefits while the worker is not at work, while the worker is not working because of the hazards of employment. When he began to the bar, this might be given in the bar, the hazards of employment. What are the hazards of employment? We have uh, caused disease, occupational diseases, compensable uh, injuries, we have these compensable disabilities. We have, of course, the last hazard of employment, which we cannot avoid. When you are already placed in a special box, being drawn by a special car, a Mercedes-Benz, or a Cadillac, that is death. So these are the hazards of employment. I happened to give this in the bar exam in 2008, this compensable uh, injury. So you can apply here the uh, coming and going rule or the proximity rule. Last year, when I uh, reviewed in different review centers, I uh, happened to discuss uh, this, uh, this principle of administration or in simple uh, concept, this is actually the doctrine of uh, personal comfort doctrine or the principle of administration. But uh, in my, uh, when I clap jokes, I, uh, I call this doctrine as a cobra doctrine. This was given the bar last year. And also this, uh, this uh, doctrine which uh, uh, does not provide for instatement of a house helper. This was given by uh, Professor Azucena last year. Uh, this is... Uh, and uh, this is a case where there will be no reinstatement where a house helper under the doctrine of fiduciary uh, relationship, which I call it Kulango doctrine. Of course, the other bar candidates know this, uh, this joke uh, about Kulango doctrine, but they cannot discuss here. By the way, so we have here uh, the social legislation which provides for economic benefits while the workers are not at work. And give examples of these laws. We have the Social Security Law, Republic Act 8282. We have the GSIS Law, Republic Act 8291. We have the Retirement Law, according to the Supreme Court. The par uh, retirement Law is uh, a form of uh, a social legislation a pursuant to Oro Enterprises case. Retirement Law, Phil Health. But even and other laws uh, that provide economic benefits while the workers is not working. This is classified. Uh, these are classified under what we call social or welfare legislation. Of course, another uh, classification of labor law is this uh, labor relations law. By the way, when you talk about the labor relations law, this is a law that gives emphasis to uh, the uh, concerted action of the, on the part of the workers. Usually arising from what right? The right to self-organization, collective bargaining, and negotiations. In other words, when you talk of labor relations law that is more akin, related with matters 
that affect the right of workers to self-organization. So the laws on unionism, the laws on strike, boycotts, fair and fair labor practices, these are laws within the domain of labor relations law. By the way, is there any relationship between labor relations and labor standards? Of course, yes. Economic issues which are covered by labor standards law are bargaining issues under the domain or within the domain of labor relations. In other words, these, uh, these two laws are actually uh, interrelated with each other. So uh, another area is, of course, this uh, administrative uh, legislation. When you talk about administrative legislation, this is not uh, administrative law within the concept of political uh, law, but this is a law, administrative law, administrative legislation within the domain of uh, labor law. And these are actually laws or labor laws that are enacted for the purpose of creating labor bodies for administrative purposes. Actually, almost all labor bodies are administrative bodies, some of them exercising quasi-judicial functions. We have the NLRC, we have the Bureau of Labor Relations, National Conciliation and Mediation Board, we have the BOEA, SSS, GSIS, all of these are labor bodies actually. Now of course the last one is a very important area. This is an area of the bar also. This is diplomatic legislation. This diplomatic legislation is actually a, uh, a form or a type of labor law that is designed to provide machinery for amicable settlement. So this is not within really the concept of political or international law, this, uh, this uh, diplomatic law, or uh, the law of diplomacy, no, no, no. But this is a type of labor law that is actually designed to provide machinery for amicable settlement. Of course, in your study of labor law, in your regular class, and in your uh, review classes, you have already come across some of these uh, uh, forms here, or machineries of amicable settlement. Like what? We have conciliation, we have uh, mediation, we have uh, grievance machinery, voluntary arbitration. Of course, uh, in case of a strike, you have this uh, principle of improved offer balloting or the principle of reduced uh, offer balloting. In other words, people, when you talk about these machineries of amicable settlement, these are actually provided by law in accord with what article of the Labor Code of the Philippines? Formerly under Article 221, but now it is uh, Article 227, under the renumbered labor code. Take note, people, that uh, you may have uh, read or you may still be reading the labor code under the uh, old, uh, old articles or old uh, 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 numbers of articles. Like in this case, Article 221, which is actually technical rules are not binding but resort to amicable settlement. Article 221 is now Article 227 under the, under the renumbered Labor Code of the Philippines. And this was renumbered pursuant to Republic Act 10151, which was uh, signed to law on June 21, I, I hope I'm right, on June 21, 
2011 and took effect in July of 2011. And incidentally, this law has uh, provided an additional chapter in Book 3, and this is night workers. In other words, people, in the case of women workers under the old labor code, women workers, as a general rule, are not allowed to work at night. But under the new law, the Public Act 10151, they are now allied, allowed to work at night. So try to uh, read this law, the Public Act 10151, because uh, this might be given the bar this year. And uh, may I tell you that uh, this year, uh, you are very lucky if you are going to take the bar this year because uh, you will have a chairman of the bar, Justice uh, Willie Rama, who is a very uh, compassionate, understanding chairman. When we had the uh, occasion to have a meeting with him at USD, uh, he told us that uh, he will be very compassionate to the uh, bar candidates. Uh, and there will be no disqualification. By the way, uh, this is not our area. But in the meantime, this, uh, this uh, diplomatic legislation, which is aimed at providing machineries for amicable settlement, is of our area. Take note that in one case decided by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said that in every CBA or collective bargaining agreement, it should provide a conclusive arbitration clause. What is this conclusive arbitration clause in the CBA? This is a clause providing for grievance machinery or voluntary arbitration. And what is the purpose of this uh, conclusive arbitration clause? The purpose is what? The purpose is the speedy administration of labor justice. For so we want to a doctrine under the doctrine of the speedy labor justice. And what is the legal anchor of this doctrine of speedy labor justice? Article 227 of the Labor Code under the renumbered, renumbered article of the Labor Code. What is that? Article 227. So please, uh, may I remind you uh, that uh, we have now the, the renumbered uh, uh, articles of the new uh, labor code. So uh, these are actually the, uh, the classifications of labor law. We will now go to areas that are uh, also equally important in the study or in the review of labor law. We have what we call the sources of labor law. And when we talk of the uh, sources, we have the primary source. And what is the primary source of labor law? Well, we have the Philippine Constitution, the uh, fundamental charter. And uh, incidentally, in one case decided by the Supreme Court through uh, Justice Natura, he said that uh, even the conventions of the international uh, labor organization are also primary sources of uh, labor law. But in the meantime, we have this uh, constitution. And in the process of discussing these constitutional provisions on labor and social legislation, we will uh, be discussing immediately right away. <coughs> Excuse me. The, uh, the pertinent uh, uh, labor code uh, provisions. Of course, under the Constitution, we have the preamble. Although the preamble is not uh, actually uh, a, uh, a necessary part of the Constitution, you still remember that uh, although it's not necessary, it's important because uh, 
in case of ambiguities in the Constitution, uh, judicial and quasi-judicial bodies can still uh, consult uh, the preamble. By the way, in the 1987 preamble, there is a uh, state. Uh, there is a, uh, shall we say, uh, a statement there, which is a departure from the old preamble, which replaces uh, the promotion of the general welfare with uh, a revolutionized concept of promotion of the common good. This might be given, not in labor law, but this might be given political law, but uh, take note people that uh, there is a, uh, a distinction between promotion of the general welfare and the promotion of the common good. Because when you talk of uh, promotion of general welfare according to uh, the proponent, the chairman, of the Committee on Preamble of 1996 Constitutional Commission, Mr. Blas Opler. He said that uh, the phrase uh, promotion of general welfare is uh, a concept that admits an exception. So a law, a law can be enacted just to cater a particular sector of the society which according to him violates the principle of egalitarianism, or the principle of equality. So uh, the committee of uh, Mr. Blas Opler decided to change this with a revolutionized concept, and its promotion of the common good, which simply means promotion of the welfare of all the people. So when you when you define now uh, the concept of police power, this is uh, simply a, a, uh, the enactment of uh, reasonable, reasonable laws in order to promote uh, the enactment of wholesome or reasonable laws in order to promote the common good, not to promote the general welfare. This is the new revolutionized concept of uh, what we call the uh, police power uh, uh, concept. So take note of these people, very, very important because uh, this promotion of the common good was uh, rever reverberated or resounded in uh, Article 12, Section 6 of uh, the Constitution, which says, the right to property bears a social function and all economic agents thereof shall be geared towards the promotion of the common good in accord with distributive justice. Uh, this is not yet given the bar, this principle of distributive justice, but the principle of distributive justice was actually pronounced in Article 12, Section 6 of uh, the Philippine Constitution. But when you talk of principle of distributive justice, this is plain and simple power of eminent domain. So I, I suppose uh, you know this already. All right, let's continue. Of course, Article 2 is pregnant with uh, provisions uh, that affect labor. Of course, uh, we have this uh, doctrine of incorporation. Doctrine of incorporation is applied in labor law in view of the declaration of the Supreme Court which said that conventions of the ILO are also primary sources of labor law. So under the uh, doctrine of incorporation clause, the uh, conventions drafted, enacted, when the International Labor Organization are now part of our municipal law. As a matter of fact, some of these conventions can be found in the Constitution, can be found in other laws enacted by Congress of the Philippines under this uh, principle of doctrine of uh, 
incorporation cost. Well, another, we have this uh, protection to labor. Incidentally, the protection to labor clause under the 1987 Constitution is a carry over from the 1973 Constitution. And uh, the protection to labor is also defined in the Article 3 of the Labor Code of the Philippines, which says, the state shall afford protection to labor, promote full employment and equality employment, ensure equal work opportunities regardless of sex, race, or creed, and regulate the relations between workers and employers. The state shall assure the rights of workers, self-organization, collective bargaining, security of tenure, and just and humane conditions of work. In other words, this, this area of the Constitution, this area of the Labor Code, has already been given the bar several times in what types of questions. What is protection to labor clause? Why is there a need to protect labor? What is the declaration of policy in the labor code, etc., and so on and so forth? In other words, if you know the declaration of policy on labor in Article 3 of the labor code, you can answer any bar question on this area. Protection to labor clause. So, why is there a need to protect labor? All right, you have to consider the factors of production, labor and capital. As between labor and capital, labor is weak and helpless. Why? Because of its economic dependence upon capital. In other words, for the reason that labor is economically dependent upon capital, labor is weak and helpless. And capital can easily abuse labor. That is the reason why such declaration pronouncement under the Constitution, why such constitutional mandate under the Constitution to protect labor. Of course, you have to consider that uh, in the protection of labor, it does not mean that you have to abuse or oppress the rights of the employer. Because the modern concept of the relationship between labor and capital now is that they are now both partners of national development. That's why it is declared under the civil code Article 1700, 1701, 1702. Neither capital nor labor shall act oppressively against each other or impair in or injure public interest. The relationship between labor and capital is impressed with public interest. In other words, if labor has committed an offense, the proper penalty shall be uh, shall be uh, meted out to the hiring employee. If the employer unceremoniously dismisses an employee, the proper penalty shall also be imposed against the employer. Otherwise, if an employee commits an offense, but despite the facts, despite the fact that he was he has committed the defense, still the labor arbiter ordered his reinstatement, the Supreme Court said, that is an oppression and that will lead to the self-destruction of capital. Violated of what principle under the civil code of the Philippines? The principle of non-oppression. So this is, a, this is a very important area, people, this protection to labor. So the state shall afford protection to labor, promote full employment. By the way, what is full employment? Very big Samarian, this might be given in the bar. You know, these are terms or words that are very important for purposes of MCQs. 
So what is full employment? When you talk about full employment, it does not mean that everybody is employed, that it's impossible. But what is the concept of full employment? When you talk employment, it simply means what? That the worker can find work at the prevailing rates of pay without any undue difficulty. In other words, when you talk of full employment, there are more job openings than job applicants. In other words, there are more job openings than job applicants. So a worker can find work without any undue difficulty. That is the meaning of full employment. So, in order to protect labor, the law, the Constitution mandates full employment. Other than that, the Constitution also mandates the enactment of uh, a living wage. So take note of these people, very important. The states allow for protection to labor, promote full employment and equality employment. Ensure equal work opportunities regardless of sex, race, or creed. And regulate the relations between workers and employers. Well, aside from this uh, full employment clause, we have this uh, emancipation of the people from poverty clause. In other words, how can we emancipate, emancipate the people from poverty? By providing full employment? By providing them what we call a, a uh, living wage? But what is poverty? Of course, when you talk about poverty, it simply means uh, uh, a situation where the worker's family cannot uh, or cannot uh, do not have, shall I say, a decent standard of living. In other words, when we talk about uh, Poverty, the worker and his family do not enjoy a decent standard of living. If they do not enjoy a decent standard of living, then the worker and his family in a state of poverty. So how would you or how would we emancipate the people from poverty? We will emancipate the people from property, especially the workers, by providing them full employment, by providing them a full uh, a living wage, and of course, uh, what is utmost is the protection of their rights under the law. So, uh, emancipation of the people from property. By the way. What is a living wage? This might be given in the bar. When we talk about living wage, this is not a, uh, a minimum wage. A minimum wage is not living wage. But when you talk about a minimum wage, as defined by the Supreme Court, a minimum wage is actually provided in order to uh, provide a rock bottom protection to the workers by providing a, a demarcation line so that wages may not fall. I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. So what is the purpose of, living, of uh, minimum wage? The minimum wage purpose is to prohibit the uh, the, uh, the diminution or reduction of benefits from the minimum. In other words, as a general rule under the labor code, wages cannot be subject of collective bargaining. But can the parties negotiate on higher wages? Of course, yes. 
what is prohibited under the law is to what? To prevent that these wages may fall from the minimum. But the parties, of course, can agree on higher wages from the minimum. So that is minimum wage. But uh, living wage is not minimum wage. Because when we talk of, of living wage, this is uh, not a mere subsistence wage. But this is a wage where a worker and his family can live in reasonable comfort. What do you mean by that? That the worker and his family can live in reasonable comfort. That the worker and his family enjoy a decent standard of living. That is the meaning of living wage. By the way, this is one of the constitutional rights of a worker under Article 13. By the way, take note that Article 2 of the Constitution and Article 13 of the Constitution are the favorite areas of the bar examiners. These are the fertile areas of the bar exam. I gave this in 2008. Justice Dina, uh, Justice Natura gave this in 2009. Also, this was, this was also given last year, this area on Article 13 and Article 2. Oh my God. Ito yung tinatawag nating areas na pulpus na pulpus na. But, be that as it may, for purposes of uh, passing the bar and join this uh, universal uh, profession on earth is for you to pass the bar. And you have to, uh, so we say, uh, uh, acclimatize yourself with the areas of the bar for you to become a sure bar passer. So uh, we have this uh, protection to labor, emancipation of the uh, emancipation of the people from poverty clause, and there is this uh, promotion of social justice clause. This was also given in the bar last year. MCQs. Bear in mind, read the total provisions, read the explanations, annotations of the authors, read pertinent jurisprudence. Don't take chances. What is, is, what is important is for you to pass the bar. Those are the only guidelines. Codal provisions because of the MCQs, the explanations, annotations of the authors, and jurisprudence. Taman Of course, uh, on the eve of the bar exam, may mga lumalabas na tips just read. This may help. There were uh, moments in my life where there were tips coming out which were actually the very questions in the bar. Perhaps uh, that was only uh, an accidental or incidental, but uh, the fact that the uh, same questions were given in the bar these are really short tips, but be does not may, don't, uh, so we say, be uh, misguided by these tips. Just read it. Walang mawawala. Sabi nga nila, walang mawawala. Basahin nyo in order to, uh, uh, so we say, uh, satisfy huh? your desire to become a lawyer. Mamaya sabihin mo, but hindi ko nabasa, hindi ko nabasa. So important is important that you read everything. By the way, we have the social justice clause of the Constitution, which was classic, classically defined by Justice Laurel in Kalalang versus Williams. I uh, suppose you still uh, remember this classic, 
classical definition. No lawyer will ever become a lawyer if he does not know the uh, this classical classical definition because uh, uh, the professors of law in the in the regular class, especially first year, the political law one, in the Gusapan yan, uh, graded recitation yan, define social justice according to uh, Kalalan Will, uh, versus Williams. So you should know by heart the meaning of social justice. So social justice simply means what? Social justice is neither communism, nor despotism, nor atomism, nor anarchy, but the humanization of laws and the equalization of the social economic forces of the state, so that justice in its rational an objectively secular consumption may at least be approximated. Second sentence. Social, social justice means the promotion of the welfare of all the people. The adoption of the government of measures calculated to ensure the economic stability of all the component elements of the society. To the maintenance of a proper economic and social equilibrium in the relations of the members of the community constitutionally through the adoption of measures legally justifiable or extra constitutionally through the exercise of powers underlying the existence of all governments at the time honor principle of salus populi as suprema lex. In the meantime may I tell you that the basis of police power are also the basis of social justice. By the way, uh, I'm about to uh, end up my uh, first uh, first uh, salvo of my lecture. I'll be back for, uh, after a few minutes.